Welcome back. You're listening to the discussion Accelerating DoD Missions with Identity and Access Management, sponsored by Okta on Federal News Network. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guest today is Sean Frazier, the Federal Chief Security Officer at Okta. Sean, before break, we we're talking a little bit about identity and access management. You mentioned a, a, a big buzzword that we hear across the federal community, zero trust. Let's start there. A lot of people think, and we've talked about this quite a bit, zero trust. It, I got to get to zero trust. I have to implement my zero trust. And in a sense, it's a framework, it's an idea, it's a concept, and there's a lot of different pieces. But let's define zero trust a little bit, and then let's talk about how this can be enabled across DOD and, and other agencies. Yeah, it's definitely a framework, Jason. And I always like to call it a lifestyle choice because it really is kind of embracing a, a different thought model when it comes to delivering security. Um, one of the things to understand about what Zero Trust is is to also understand what it isn't. And it isn't a product. It isn't something that someone can sell you. There's no company, one company in the world who's going to say, buy Zero Trust from me and you'll be Zero Trusty and everything. All, all problems will be solved. Um, we did a lot of research. The, the Federal CIO Council a few years ago um, brought Act IAC in. There were a lot of participants like myself and others who did a lot of research around Zero Trust to define for agencies what it was and how it could help. Um, now we're starting to see phase two of that. Um, NIST and NCCOE are working on um, some reference architectures around Zero Trust, which will kind of help agencies see it because it, you know, it's one thing to understand what it is. It's another thing to see it in the reference architecture and see it in practice. So that you can kind of take the lessons from it and adopt it, you know, some of those things as your own. The other thing I will say about zero trust is uh, it is also uh, John Kindervag, who coined the frame zero, uh, who coined the phrase zero trust, talks about it being a bespoke journey. And what that means is for every agency, it's going to be a little different. So if you think you're going to be able to take a zero trust Gantt chart and just kind of map it into your your infrastructure and say I'm done, that's not true. Which is one of the reasons why you've got to build it into your DNA. You build it into your conversations internally as a security organization, and, and you you mold it and and adapt it to your architecture. Um, you know we talk about identity and access management as being one of the core pillars of zero trust and a really great place to start the journey. But there are other aspects as well that some agencies will, will, will adopt and some agencies won't. So it's important for CISOs and agencies to be able to kind of start with that, start with that mindset, build the conversations into their agencies as they're talking about it. Because um, otherwise, you know, if you think about it, you're going to kind of go, go down the rat hole of analysis paralysis, where you're going to look at all the things that, that I can't do, which means I'm not going to do anything. So you got to start somewhere. I think a key piece to this that a lot of people overlook is that there's already existing pieces, some of that bespoke pieces, the spokes to the wheel already exist. I always like to point out the, the continuous diagnostics and mitigation program is one example. I think the identity and access management piece is another example. It is, is as you talk to agencies, are they kind of starting to put their pieces in place to say, okay, we want to get to zero trust on the map. Here's the paths to get there. They are, and I think you're exactly right. The, none of these things are happening in a vacuum. So CDMs kind of being brought in and folks are talking about how does that reference or, or work with a zero trust architecture. TIC 3.0 is another good one, right? So TIC 3.0 is kind of the adoption of a different model of cloud access. So uh, much like HSPD 12, when TIC came out, it was talking about, I mean, in the agency accessing internet resources outside my agency, and it was really only dealing with that use case. So the outside outside conversation was never, really really never taken into account. So if I'm a user who's teleworking and I'm accessing you know a cloud service provider like Salesforce or ServiceNow or something like that, I don't have to go back to the the, the agency network. So TIC 3.0 really kind of adapts itself to the way we really use and compute these days. So a lot of those things, even the identity and access management guidance that have come out. So you look at 863.3, you look at M1917 that came out of OMB. These are all tangential to zero trust and they're all required to be able to think about how I'm holistically deploying zero trust in my agency. So again, none of these things are happening in a vacuum. They're all related and they all exist you know, to, together for a reason. So I remember the act IAC effort that you uh, put together, the white paper, that offered up some some good insights. It's been a couple of years since then, I think maybe two, maybe three by now. Can you offer, are, are there some examples that you're seeing in agencies? And even if you can't get specific on an agency, are you seeing some examples of zero trust or, or pieces of zero trust that are coming together and, and actually doing what we what we envision them to do? I am. I'm definitely seeing it. And again, I think one of the things that's accelerating that is what we've dealt with in 2020. So before it was kind of like, 
you know, notionally agencies want to adopt zero trust. It makes sense philosophically, especially for DOD and other agencies and other, you know, um, sub agencies to be able to adopt it. But I think when the rubber hits the road and you see a use case where, oh, this is exactly the way zero trust, what zero trust was designed to, to, to work within this framework of, of kind of telework and access from anywhere to anywhere. So I'm seeing agencies really kind of adopt that. It's, it's interesting you know, before when actually could go meet customers, you know, people would come in to, to a meeting and they would they would come down, come in and sit down and they'd have the the O'Reilly Zero Trust book and we talk about it. Then over time, they'd have the O'Reilly Zero Trust book and the act Act report and they kind of bring that in, drop it on the table. So I'm reading these two things. It's kind of getting me started. And it has been a couple of years. But as I mentioned earlier, there's some good work, some phase two work that's happening to be able to extend that. There's the reference architecture stuff that's happening. There is the kind of fine tuning the, the definitions around zero trust and what it means for agencies. And, and again, pointing out clearer how it relates to things like CDM and tic 3 and some of the other things that agencies have to kind of adhere to and pay attention to. So Sean, we know there's a new federal CISO that just is joining the uh, uh, Biden administration, uh, uh, Krista Russia. Um, if you would offer him a little bit of, of advice when it comes to identity access management, when it comes to zero trust, what, what's on his to-do list? What, what, what is something that OMB slash CISA slash NISC could do to kind of continue to push this forward? So I think we need to think about, and, and, you know, he's a, he's a great guy and I think he's done, he's done great work in, in his previous life. And, and I love his philosophy about things anyway. So I think he would, he would take this heart to heart and he's probably already thinking about it. But none of this stuff needs to be thought of in a vacuum. So we think about cybersecurity and all the threats that we're dealing with, and they're consistent threats. And a lot of them are, are um, you know, consistent uh, threat vectors as well. When you think about identity, uh, you know, whether it's phishing or whether it's it's kind of SAML hijacking or some of the things that we've seen over the last period of time, those are all things where we have to apply kind of zero trust principles to protect against. So my advice to him is, is keep putting the, the, the foot on the accelerator for zero trust, build that in. As you're looking at kind of technical technology modernization capability for agencies, build cybersecurity right in there with it. Because it, it, the, the more we think about cybersecurity as being this other thing, so we think about digital transformation as being a thing and we go do do that and we did it and then cyber is this other thing way over here they it can't be this other thing way over here they got to be tied together they get they, they're they're two two halves of the same coin if you're thinking about deliver services you got to think about cyber and i know he thinks that way so i'm probably you know preaching to the choir but that's what i would say all right very good advice the other piece i think is important to weave into this conversation is we're talking a lot about what it has to get done. You know, be aware of as you move into zero trust, there's pieces, you can't look at it in a vacuum, but there are pockets of this innovation specifically happening across DOD. Let's go through some of those because I think one of the keys here is this idea of DevSecOps that we're starting really to, to it's, we're seeing gain a bigger and better hold. Walk me through some of the things you're seeing around DOD where there's some innovations. Yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of, of Kessel Run and Platform One and Cloud One and some of these innovative DevSecOps environments for DoD, because I, I'm a true believer in that security starts from the beginning. So when you're building applications, you got to think about, as I mentioned earlier, cyber being part and parcel to this, security being part and parcel. As you're building applications, cyber and security have to be first class citizens in those conversations. They can't be afterthoughts. And these platforms are really designed to do that. So as they're, they're fielding requests for capability, right? So, so the A1 or somebody might come to them and go, hey, I need this application to do X and I need it quickly, right? I, I'm working on agile timeframes. That's awesome. And that's exactly what they're doing. But it would, be, it would be a mistake to not build security in at that speed as well. And I know these guys are thinking about it, which is awesome because you know, nothing, you know, nothing is worse to me than having something that's this awesome application, very innovative, and it's got vulnerabilities, right? And then you got to go back and patch the vulnerabilities and you spend so much time kind of reassessing what you've already built when it would have saved you a ton of time just to build it on the front end. So these organizations, like I said, I'm a big fan because that's the way I think it needs to be done. I moderated a recent FCA Bethesda breakfast on speed and security. So very the exact topic you just brought up. And one of the statistics that came up was something effective like 83% of all applications have vulnerabilities on the you know the first time someone has kind of gone through it and a lot of those vulnerabilities deal with the leakage of information and cryptographic type of vulnerabilities and so this goes back to speed innovation but also security and, and i think that that can bringing that together 
and, and then having a, a really rigorous identity management piece is really what we're talking about here is really the future. What is, what is, the, what is the difficulty in doing that? Is it, because you, you can't sacrifice speed for, for innovation and you can't sacrifice rigorousness for usability. Yeah, it's exactly right. And that's why you need to look at partners who think about this the same way you do. And, and you know, like us at Okta, we want to make sure that we're building capabilities for developers that are secure from the outset. So we're not thinking about security as being added later. We're thinking about it as, as you're developing your application and you need to integrate into an ID system. Uh, we need to make sure that security plumbing is there. So protecting data at rest, protecting data in motion providing uh, a, a protected communication path. So obviously secure SAML, secure OpenID Connect. Um, so, so you pick partners who have the same philosophy, which is protect everything all the time and you start at dev time. So you start with the developers, because I get it, you know, I, I was a developer a long, long time ago. Um, and, you know, developers are path of least resistance people, right? You have a deadline to develop an app, you're gonna do it as quickly as you can. And back in the, the old days, we would never even turn on SSL. Hey, I turn on SSL, that means I gotta do key pair stuff. I'm not doing any of that, it's just, it's hard. So you need to make it easier for developers to do the right thing. And I think part of that is where the DevSecOps comes in because by, by automating a lot of this security compliance issues, by automating a lot of the testing, by making it easy, as you said, make it a first class citizen, then you are addressing those, those challenges. Uh, Sean, we're just about out of time before I let you go. What's the big takeaway from our conversation today? When, when, if, if you want to leave the audience with one really important message, what's that? So it's a couple of things. The, the first thing is, you know, we, we've kind of harped on it, but it's worth harping on it again, is, is security is a first class citizen built into the DNA of your decisioning. So security has got to be part of that. The flip side of that, which we hit on a little bit, which I think is also extremely important, is user experience, user culture. We got to make sure that we're building things that users will use. One of the reasons why I'm a big fan of, of Kessel Run and the other technologies is because, frankly, they've got younger people coming in and kind of saying, hey, I've, I've never lived a life without an iPhone. I use Touch ID and Face ID. I'm used to these kinds of technologies. I want to figure out how to leverage that for the mission. Um, so listening to those folks and being able to build things that are usable, because the most secure system in the world, if it's not usable, no one's going to use it. And, and the technology we have today, it's so easy to go around it, right? I've got a, I've got a mini computer in my pocket. Everybody does, right? It's got all the bells and whistles I need. If, if the thing you give me isn't working, I'll you take the thing that I bought, which works really well, and I'll use that. So making sure we're paying attention to culture, paying attention to usability, um, and it's hard. We talked about that being a balance, and it absolutely is a balance, but it's a balance we're taking into account as part of your security DNA. And the way you do that is through rigorous identity management and access management. Don't forget about that. Exactly. And leveraging off the shelf technology. So leveraging biometric. We didn't really talk about uh, web off end, but that's another thing I encourage people when you're thinking about your identity infrastructure. And I think about as CAC PIV being PKI 1.0. I look at web off in and the FIDO2 stuff being PKI 2.0. So if you're an agency looking at how do I modernize A, this is B. All right, I think that's something for next time. We'll have more to talk about then. Unfortunately, we're out of time for today. Let me thank my guest. Sean Frazier is the Federal Chief Security Officer at Okta. Sean, always a pleasure to catch up. Always, thanks Jason. I'm Jason Miller and you've been listening to the discussion Accelerating DoD Missions with Identity and Access Management sponsored by Okta on Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search Okta.